I'm Ron Cass. I'm the chair of the Federal Society Practice Group on Administrative Law, and I want to welcome everybody to the Federal Society's program on uh, antitrust and Google and the digital age and everything exciting that's happening. I understand there's a series of programs on this taking place this week in Washington, and uh, because they had heard we had one, the Senate scheduled one of their own for uh, later in the week. Uh, I'm also told that those of you who want to tweet about this uh, should use as your hashtag, if I have this correct, FedSocAT. Now, I don't know what tweeting is. I don't know what a hashtag is. Um, I, I, I try to make sure that I'm up with the latest technology through at least the 1900s. Um, I, as, as I was thinking about the program today, I was uh, reminded about a story one of my graduates from law school uh, told me when uh, he had been at a, a law firm as a young associate and late one night went by uh, the senior partner's office and the senior partner was across the hall at his secretary's desk standing by the shredder with a document. <clears throat> and he looked at the uh, young associate who was going by and said, can you help me with this? I just don't know how it works. And the associate said, you just put it right in here and you press this button. He said, thanks, that's terrific. I want four copies. <laughs> you know, th there are times when uh, technology moves fast enough that people have a little bit of trouble keeping up with it. Uh, one of the great things about Washington is that there's always somebody in government on top of this and there's some group ready to help you adjust to the, the newest technology, whether it's through litigation, through administrative hearings, uh, through Senate hearings, or through some other mechanism. Uh, as we look at what's been happening uh, over the last uh, few decades in the high-tech space, we've seen a series of very high-profile antitrust issues sort of rotating through as technology changes and the players change, the technological question changes, although many times the antitrust question seems to stay relatively constant. Uh, we have a first-rate panel of people to talk about what's happening today as Google comes under the microscope of antitrust law. And we will introduce them. They'll, they'll each say a little bit about what it is they think is most important to keep in mind. And then we'll be asking them a series of questions about it, uh, followed by questions from the audience. We encourage you to, as they are, are talking, think about what it is you would like to ask them and later on ask them why they didn't cover that and why they are trying to hide from you. Um, we, uh, we will go in, in uh, an order which was carefully selected. It's alphabetical by last name. And I will just give very brief introductions to our panel members. They are extremely well known in the antitrust and high-tech communities, and the Federalist Society is delighted to have them here with us today. Uh, our first uh, commentator will be uh, Tom Barnett. Tom is a partner in the Washington office of Covington and Burling. He is the co-chair of the firm's antitrust and consumer law practice group, and he was the assistant attorney general for antitrust. He has an extensive background in antitrust and consumer law and knows this area extremely well. Uh, he also has had the opportunity to teach the uh, subject at both Georgetown Law Center and the University of Virginia Law School. Jim Grimmelman uh, is an associate professor at the New York Law School. Uh, Jim serves as a resident fellow in the Information Project at Yale. He served as a law clerk to uh, Judge uh, Barry of the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Third Circuit and specializes in the law at the connection of your life and the internet, your life and evolving technology. And among his uh, pieces is one called Saving Facebook. Uh, when I asked him what, uh, whether the question was uh, why or how, uh, he gave me the, the nice indulgent look you give to people who just don't understand the technology. <laughs> um, uh, Rick Rule is the head of the antitrust practice group at Kidwalder, Wicklersham, and Taft, and like uh, Tom, was a uh, U.S. Uh, the uh, Assistant Attorney General of the United States for Antitrust, uh, like uh, a member of, uh, number of other members up here, has an extensive background both in and out of government dealing with the issues before us, including extensive involvement in a case that many people will be comparing to the uh, 
uh, investigation that is just starting with respect to Google. Um, Baron Zoka is a founder of Tech Freedom. He, previous to that, had been a senior fellow and director of the Center for Internet Freedom at the Progress and uh, Freedom Foundation, and prior to that had been in practice with the communications practice group at Latham and Watkins here in Washington, D.C. He also specializes in the intersection between technology, technological developments, and uh, the law. And with that, let me turn it over to Tom, and we'll be back with questions in a little bit. Uh, well, thank you, Ron, and let me thank uh, Ron and Dean and the um, uh, folks at the Federalist Society for organizing the event. This, in my view, is certainly a very important topic, and glad to see a lot of uh, discussion and debate about it, because I think that's always a good and healthy thing. Um, since I uh, am going first, I guess I'll try and look a little bit at a, a big picture perspective, and I'm going to keep this brief to just uh, a few minutes. Um, so that we can get into discussion as well. Um, I, I think you can start with a few basic propositions that are, uh, Google likely would dispute them, but I think are, are generally hard to dispute, um, to tee up why there is a concern, at least from a general consumer perspective, setting aside for the moment whether or not there's an antitrust violation. There's a lot of commerce and activity that goes on on the Internet that's very important, and I'm sure you've all seen the numbers. When people navigate on the Internet, they use search. I mean, the large majority of people who are trying to find things on the Internet use search, and in this day and age, that means Google. They really only, in the general search market, they only have one competitor, and it is a very distant second behind. Um, so they're dominant in search and they're dominant in paid search advertising. And for the moment, I'll just uh, won't go into how they got there. The second point that's important to recognize is that Google is no longer just a search company. That's what they started out as, and at the time they had relatively pure incentives to direct people to the site at which uh, was most likely to have the information that they were seeking in response to their query. And indeed, at the time, Google had a mission statement that said, we may be the only website in the world whose goal is to get you off our website as quickly as possible. Google is now much more than that. They have gone into the area of trying to answer the queries as opposed to just directing you to where to find an answer. And that, in and of itself, may be a good thing, may not be objectionable, but it fundamentally changes Google's incentives. They are expanding into these various areas. They include maps, finance, product search, local search, um, tr online travel search that they launched last week. Um, and they now have an incentive to try to keep users on their website so that they can continue to monetize that traffic rather than sending users to whatever may be the most relevant website. And if you look at their current mission statement, it says their, their goal is to get you off their home page as quickly as possible. Maybe a subtle shift, but a very important one. Their incentive is now to get you off their home page onto another Google page, whether it's Google News or Google Places or another Google page. So you have a company that is dominant in search, paid search advertising. You have a company who is expanding into areas where it is either becoming, is dominant or is threatening to become dominant. From a consumer perspective, that should be of concern because it may or may not be an antitrust violation, but if you have dominant companies, you have effects on consumer welfare. And the way that most directly plays out, higher advertising costs that will get passed through. It can also reduce innovation in ways that we can explore. So the real question to me, and the only potentially, I think, seriously disputed question is, are, is Google engaging in conduct that advances this goal of expanding into these other areas that are improper? And I would suggest to you that there are a range of things that people have raised that would fall into the improper category. I'll give you one example for now. This involves the scraping and unauthorized use of content, including for my client, TripAdvisor. TripAdvisor, for those of you who may know it, is spent 10 years 
um, untold person hours and many millions of dollars collecting over 45 million user reviews about restaurants, hotels, and other destinations. Very valuable information. Google was scraping those user reviews and putting them into the Google Places product, which is a product that tries to collect information about a place, and displaying it on a Google page where Google could monetize it. When TripAdvisor went to Google and said, we don't want this. This is our content. We don't want our content uh, appearing on places at all. Google's response was, the only way you can keep us from displaying your user reviews on our Google Places page is if you prevent us from crawling your web pages at all, which means you will never appear on any Google search results page. They were effectively tying access to the dominant general search engine to acquiescing in the use of, their con of, of TripAdvisor's content to create a different product. I would suggest to you that that's not a proper means. Um, and interestingly, I'll, I'll, I'll end with a note that, that uh, Google has backed off of that recently, but only after there was a spotlight put on this in the context of antitrust investigations, and this was very prominently displayed in front of a number of antitrust enforcement folks. Um, so I would suggest that even Google has, through its actions, acknowledged that it was crossing the line. So with that, I'll um, turn it over to Jim. So I would like to frame the issues here by thinking about, very briefly, the path at which I've come to be interested in them. I've been following the question of whether search engines distort or mislead users by sending them to one side or another for improper reasons for close to nine years now. Uh, and I've been thinking about this since it was a small Oklahoma company called Search King suing Google, and I've only watched as the issue has gotten bigger and bigger. And in my scholarship, I focused on some of the problems that this raises and the question how you should frame it. And I my mind is open on the question of whether there can be or are actual problems here. But the three general principles that I think about as guiding my sense of how to think about search are first, that search engines, and by here we really now mean Google. It was search engines when I started and it's now mostly become Google and to a lesser extent Bing. Search engines wield enormous power and have remarkable loyalty to shape what people see on the internet if you turn to them first. The second is that there is no neutral way to use that power. Search is inescapably political, is inescapably contested. It's never going to be completely objective. They have to make decisions about what to prioritize, about what goes in the number one result, and search queries are not factual questions to which there is a single correct answer. They are always an open-ended request for more information about a topic that may not have been well expressed, on a question that may not have been clearly formulated in the user's mind, and to which there are always going to be many competing claims to offer the most relevant information. Search engines have to choose among those opportunities, and the result that they pick is always going to be open to question on some ground or another. Indeed, we turn to search engines because we want them to help us make these decisions, and the role of editorial judgment in that is inescapable. And third, there is a serious problem of spam when it comes to anything online. You see this in your inboxes. You also see it in people attempting to game their way to the top of Google's rankings by creating fake content that is not of value to users that nonetheless tricks Google's algorithms into thinking that it's highly relevant on a variety of queries. And there is a constant back and forth battle between Google's programmers and the people trying to outwit them. And the way that this cashes out is that any attempt to restrain how the search engine does its ranking jobs more or less inevitably hands some further power to the spammers in that process, giving them the ability to game their way into the rankings and potentially overwhelm it with useless things that users don't want to see. So that's kind of a general arc when it comes to thinking about search distortion, search bias, search neutrality, 
however you want to style those issues. I think there, when it comes to the antitrust case, I still don't know. I'm unconvinced by the argument that there could not be an antitrust problem here. I've seen some theoretical defenses of Google that don't strike me as across the board convincing. But I'm also unconvinced that there is currently a problem. Every time I've been shown an incident involving alleged bias in a way that seems to be an antitrust problem, and I've looked into it, I've found one of two things. Either that the site claiming bias has been offering people something that I think is demonstrably inferior to the offerings provided by its competitors or by Google itself. And you may differ in your opinions of this and think the sites are more valuable. But I've come away personally believing that Google has done a good thing to the extent it pushes them down in the rankings. Good for consumers. And one area that I have worked on, by contrast, in which I have thought Google did something that raised serious antitrust questions, was the Google Books settlement. This project involving scanning large numbers of books. We don't need to get into the details here. I just want to say that the proposed settlement in that case involved a rather novel and quite unprecedented use of the class action device to give Google a global license to sell millions of books, not necessarily with the copyright owner's permission. The judge in that case quite properly rejected the settlement, and that seems to have been the end of that particular concern. So to the extent that I had a leading single antitrust problem about Google, that one has already been resolved. General search, I'm watching closely, but I remain unconvinced of the need for action. All right. Um, waiting for the defense of Google, uh, which will be interesting. Um, I do think that uh, to start off with, and I'm sure we'll discuss uh, a lot of the specific behavior of Google that uh, has uh, come under scrutiny or criticism. Um, but before we do that, I, I think that it's uh, worth uh, contemplating some pretty fundamental issues um, to decide whether all of this is an interesting academic debate or it really has real world legal consequences. Um, and if you look at the way uh, the Federalist Society has uh, structured this discussion, the first question, and I think it's a good question, um, but I think it's a question that's been answered, and that is, you know, should the antitrust laws apply uh, to businesses like Google? Um, uh, as some of you know, uh, 15, 20 years ago, um, I thought there was an argument uh, that, uh, you know, the antitrust laws uh, should uh, be limited in terms of applying to unilateral behavior, uh, particularly in high-tech businesses. Um, however, that battle was fought, uh, and by those of us who argued for limitations on antitrust, it was lost, uh, principally in the Microsoft case. Um, and I think if you read the D.C. Circuit's opinion, which I view as kind of the leading uh, opinion in the area, the analysis is fairly f sound, um, not only in terms of traditional antitrust analysis, but also uh, in explaining how antitrust analysis can apply to high-tech businesses, how companies that have very low marginal costs, high fixed costs, like Microsoft and its operating system, Google and its search engine, um, can have market power, can have monopoly power, and can abuse it to perpetuate that monopoly power, and that the law appropriately uh, should be concerned about that and applied in those circumstances and then laid out a framework for applying it. So I think that, uh, and, and I will also say that in the decade plus since that decision, um, I, and applying it in a very direct way to Microsoft through a consent decree, but also applying it indirectly through a series of decisions, uh, the world hasn't come to an end. And I think you can make a fairly decent case that um, that consumer welfare has been affected positively rather than negatively as a result of that application of the antitrust law. So to me, um, to some extent, it's a decided question. Um, and uh, it's come out in, in a way that would suggest that 
Google is uh, an appropriate focus. Um, I also will just note in passing that um, it is a bit ironic that the people um, who run and argue on behalf of Google um, were some of the leading proponents of applying the antitrust laws to Microsoft. Um, and not just, I should say, uh, 15 years ago, uh, but very recently. Uh, generally, you will find that the people at Google um, don't really say the antitrust laws shouldn't apply to high-tech businesses. It's just that the antitrust laws shouldn't apply to Google. And it strikes me that if, if, uh, if you are arguing for the application of the law to others, you have to be ready to uh, acknowledge the appropriate application of the law to you. The second question is, okay, the law as a general matter should apply, but is Google uh, an appropriate target? Is it, in other words, a monopoly? Does it have monopoly power? And Google's principal defense here is that, well, you know, gee, competition is one click away. Um, you know, that's a nice slogan. It's not really an argument. Uh, it's really hardly a defense. It's very rare that in a, uh, a company that has monopoly power, there aren't some alternatives uh, that uh, are interchangeable in use. Um, the fact is, today, there are far fewer of those than there were five years ago for Google. Um, but that doesn't, I don't think, answer the question. You have to, uh, you know, in antitrust, you have to define relevant markets and look at the facts. Um, with respect to, uh, you know, consumer use of search engines, if, and that's where Google uh, would like you to focus, um, Google itself has acknowledged that it has tremendous advantages in scale uh, and ability to deliver fresh queries, access to information that in its more candid moments, its officials have acknowledged create uh, barriers to entry. Um, and even in that area where competition is one click away, they have displayed persistent and growing uh, market share. Their shares, depending on whose measurement you look at, is anywhere from 65 to 80 percent of searches done in the United States are done either by Google on Google's site or on sites that Google runs the search for. Worldwide, the share is much larger. But if you look at where the money is, and it's always helpful to follow the money, uh, that's advertising. Google's share is much larger. Um, sort of at the low end, you see 80 percent as their share of search advertising. Um, and then if you look at the area where search is growing uh, the fastest and where you can perhaps understand Google's interest in things like TripAdvisor, which is mobile search, Google's share is much larger there. There they uh, currently conduct something like 97 percent of all mobile searches. So if you look at the law, I think you, you, know, you define the market um, either as uh, you know, uh, just search, uh, natural search, or more appropriately, paid search, or even search syndication, where they have a 95 percent share, or even mobile search. In all of those areas, Google has shares that courts pretty consistently find to be uh, at least an indirect indication of monopoly power. So I think that, to me, the, uh, uh, as somebody who remembers the arguments that Microsoft made 15 years ago that it was not a monopoly, um, that uh, those arguments that Google is trying to run have been run and have been dismissed. And I think that it's very hard to look at the evidence and conclude that Google does not have monopoly power. Now, that doesn't mean that um, it, it's violated the law. It doesn't mean that um, uh, it should be regulated, either by courts or by some agency. But what it does mean is that its conduct is subject to a higher standard than normal firms. There are things that it cannot do that other firms can. And to me, the issue for Google is essentially recognizing and acknowledging its responsibility given its, its share. And I think that um, that sort of acknowledgement and recognition then can help frame 
uh, the evaluation of the myriad of conduct that people raise that cl they claim is anti-competitive. And we can look at, based on standards and based on analysis like uh, the D.C. Circuit's opinion, whether or not uh, that conduct does violate the antitrust laws, assuming that uh, Google provides the facts and we can ana analyze the facts and draw distinctions between whether what Google is doing is really trying to help the user or whether what Google is trying to do is essentially maximize its profits and perpetuate its position uh, in a way that harms other competitors. And hopefully, once we get through these opening remarks, we'll explore that a little more. Baron. Thanks. Uh, so I want to first uh, start by emphasizing that I'm not an antitrust expert. Everything I know about antitrust law, Tom Barnett taught me at UVA. So uh, I, uh, if, if you hear any mistakes today, you can blame the teacher and not the student. Uh, but I say that out of respect, actually, by saying that um, uh, I think Tom and Rick you know, were, were hired by their clients for a reason. They're the best in the business. And in particular, as Rick alluded to, you know, they made arguments for many years uh, that come from the perspective that you'll hear me express today, which is one of general skepticism about government intervention and a constrained view of antitrust. And if I were their clients, I would have hired them because you want someone from the other side to make arguments for you. So I say that not to suggest that they're being in any way hypocritical, uh, but because they're being what good practitioners always are, which is advocates for their clients and someone who's going to make the best argument they can. Uh, for my own part, I've spent several years working on this issue as well as a number of other issues. First, as you heard, at, at the Progress and Freedom Foundation, which was one of those groups that uh, joined what I think was a uh, persecution of Microsoft in the 90s. Uh, and we at PFF always tried, uh, in, for, when, in the time that I was there, to take a broad uh, principled approach based on a skepticism about government intervention. And it's from that position that I come here today. So I'm not here to defend Google. You'll hear Google do that, I'm sure, perfectly well on Wednesday. I'm here really to speak for uh, a view, generally speaking, about the role of government in the marketplace. And it's one that comes from my roots as a longtime um, member of the Federal Society, one that I think you, you ought to all um, keep in mind. And, and so let me uh, start by saying that this is really not about Google. This is about the way that antitrust is going to regulate digital markets generally, just as the Microsoft case was about the role that uh, antitrust would have in the big picture. So uh, I think we need to be careful about making this too much today about Google. Google is really a case study, and it's the case study that will inform what government's role is in the marketplace in the future. Uh, I, I have defended Microsoft here in the past. I think Microsoft, the Microsoft case was wrongly decided. I'd like to hear Rick uh, explain what exactly he thinks that case did to benefit consumers. But I've also pointed out that uh, Google doesn't have clean hands here either. Um, unfortunately, Mil what Milton Friedman said about the business community's suicidal impulse is true, that business is never consistent. They're never advocates uh, consistently for a limited role for government. And generally speaking, businesses do what they need to do to be loyal to their shareholders, which is use every tool they have at their disposal and hire the best counsel they can to screw their competitors. And uh, I want to say that in general, uh, antitrust has a role to play, but it's a role that is generally best served when you don't see antitrust acting. It, it's something that um, Tom mentioned this. Uh, Tom complained about the scraping of results and said that uh, after antitrust concerns were raised, Google stopped doing that. So assuming that that was an antitrust violation, that's the best sort of outcome we could hope for, which is to say that antitrust is like uh, the hound of the Baskervilles in uh, Sir Arthur Conan's famous story about Sherlock Holmes. It's the dog that didn't bark. In other words, it works in the background to encourage companies to behave well, uh, both as a carrot and a stick. And so as an example of a carrot, I would say that there are things that Google has done in terms of making data portable that uh, demonstrate that antitrust does have some power in encouraging companies to um, give themselves an argument that, hey, we're making it as easy as possible to switch away from our product and we're not artificially increasing switching costs. Um, but I, I want to suggest that there are really three conflicts that you're going to hear about today. The first is a big picture philosophical conflict about the way we look at the world. And if anybody here has read Thomas Sowell's work on the conflict of visions, that's really what I'm talking about. And it comes down to a conflict between people who think that our knowledge of the future is very constrained and that we have to be humble and skeptical about how we intervene because we really don't know what's around the next corner. And I would briefly give you a parable there. This morning as I uh, went over to get here, I'd just come back from travel and had to pick up my dry cleaning and was driving down a one-way street and looking for a parking space on the left side of the street. And I was obviously in a rush to get here, and the stakes were high, and wanted to make sure I wasn't late. And I took the first parking space I could, because I couldn't see what was beyond that space. 
I walked three cars ahead and realized that the entire rest of the street closer to my uh, dry cleaners was empty. And the point of that example is that sitting on the left side of the road, looking for a parking space on that side on a one-way street, I couldn't see what was coming. Literally, what was around the next corner was invisible to me. And generally speaking here, I think that's the case with antitrust intervention. We have no idea what's around the corner. We, when, we make, when we talk about the market here being search, we make a fundamental error. The market is not search. The market is finding information. You might call it consumer research. And in that sense, we don't know how that's, that market is going to evolve. But I will tell you that we're starting to see it change fundamentally. And it's changing as people are moving away from putting in keywords to using social search, which is a field that Facebook today dominates. And Facebook, in partnership with Microsoft, may very well be the next dominant player here. And I wouldn't be surprised to be at a table a few years from now arguing about whether the social graft is the essential facility. And, and I will play the same role, which is being skeptical about government intervention. So again, this is not about Google. Uh, but more generally, that conflict of vision comes down to, again, do we trust the dispersed, bottom-up knowledge that comes through the marketplace? Do we trust the general process of evolutionary dynamism? Or instead, do we fall back on what Virginia Pistrell called the stasis mentality? Do we look at the future and imagine what it will be like based on today? And unfortunately, that really is the only lens through which we have to understand the future. And it's one that should make us very skeptical about error costs. And this is the second great conflict I want to call to your attention. This is a conflict about the role of antitrust in early um, stage markets. And I would point you here to the work that my colleagues, Jeff Manny and Josh Wright at the International Center for Law and Economics have done with their paper on um, error costs and the limits of antitrust. And in particular, pointing out and building on the work that uh, Easterbrook and others have done, that error costs, that is the, 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 the costs of false positives, of intervening too early, rise when we're talking about uh, early stage markets. And on the contrary, that uh, technology that the market is actually better able to unseat incumbents and provide an alternative uh, than government is. And the third and final conflict that I would just plant with you today is that when you look at the marketplace today, it's not a conflict between specifically Google and Microsoft, although you would certainly think that it was from all the heat that surrounds that fight. It's really a, a conflict of paradigms about how you find information. And my point to say uh, to, today is to say that we don't know what the right answer is. Google is not just a business, it is a paradigm. It's a paradigm that today is fundamentally based on searching by keywords. And the paradigms of the future that Facebook and Twitter and others are bringing into play here may look fundamentally different. We don't know how that marketplace is going to sort out, but we do know that Google is actually lagging behind, just as Microsoft has in the past lagged behind. Microsoft has been wonderfully innovative in many ways. I was myself a Windows Mobile user and gave up on the platform eventually because Microsoft just took too long to roll out Windows Mobile Phone 7. If Windows, uh, if that had come out earlier, uh, Windows might be in a very different place. They might have a much larger share of the mobile marketplace. If uh, indeed, if, if Microsoft had bought the ad platform that it looked at in 2003, 2004, it might be Microsoft today that leads in the marketplace. And my point is not to say that, that Microsoft is a bad company or slow, but first and foremost that Microsoft and its behavior has been shaped by antitrust intervention. Microsoft is in jail and seems to think that everybody else should be too. And I want to say that in general, companies should be free to innovate and compete. And that competition will be vicious. And it's something that in the end I think is good for consumers. Well, thanks to, to all the panel members for the, the opening statements, which give us a lot to chew on. Uh, I'm going to start by, by sort of uh, working backward <coughs> from the, the presentations here and picking up Barron's uh, last comment about the sort of paradigm between uh, having uh, more faith in markets or less faith in markets between uh, thinking you can see around the corner and thinking you can't see around the corner. Um, and, and ask, uh, if I can, sort of start back uh, with Rick Rule, uh, who uh, was in his uh, comments, I think, saying, look, a lot of these questions have been answered already. Uh, they've been answered in the Microsoft case by the D.C. Circuit. Uh, we fought uh, a, a fight, uh, a lot of people, including Rick, against the application of uh, the antitrust laws to uh, high-tech companies, to evolving markets, to fast-moving businesses. Uh, that fight is over now, and the question is, how do we move on? And the, and the question I want to start, Rick, by, by asking you is, is, is that uh, really a, a fair characterization, or is that the right characterization of the uh, Microsoft decision from the, the D.C. Circuit, or is, is it a decision that says, look, we know the antitrust laws apply 
to everybody. Uh, there's a question of how they apply, and maybe in certain cases, like where we have high technology that evolves very quickly, we need to have uh, something different in mind in the particulars of the application. So let me start by, by putting that one back to you, and then we'll, we'll work out to the others. Um, I think there's no question that the antitrust laws have to, uh, if you will, be cognizant of the industry and the peculiar, uh, you know, characteristics of the industry in the way they get applied. And I certainly think that the D.C. Circuit tried to do that. It noted that um, that there are particular challenges for the antitrust laws in dealing with fast-moving businesses. I think that's one of the lessons from the antitrust uh, decision there is that you can't, you know, at, you, at your peril, wait and see how these markets develop because, um, I, you know, if it, if it turns out that a company like Google has been around for and, and pretty much had a monopoly and somebody pointed out that uh, there's a quote from Eric Schmidt in 2003 that says that scale is uh, a principal barrier to entry for search. He noted that in 2003 and uh, eight years later it seems to in fact be accurate. Um, so I, I think you, you do have to act quickly. I do think you uh, have to keep in mind the special characteristics of the industry. But I don't think that means that certain industries should be exempt from the antitrust laws or that, you know, slogans should protect companies from where they appear. They look like a duck, they walk like a duck, they quack like a duck. Well, maybe they're a duck, and, and that seems to be the situation with Google. And I think Google, in effect, it's, uh, it's an appropriate focus of whether or not it's engaged in monopoly behavior. And the, the last thing I would say is, you know, those of you who have known me for years know that, uh, that I would have said many of the same things that Barron said. Um, and have said them in the past. Um, and in fact, I remember giving a speech that was pretty controversial when I was in the antitrust division in 1984 talking about error costs and that antitrust was really just a form of regulation. Antitrust lawyers didn't particularly like me then uh, for saying that. And it's kind of interesting how it's become, uh, uh, you know, knowledge. So I, 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 you know, I'm sympathetic to it, but to me, the important thing is once you establish a set of legal rules, legal principles, particularly ones that affect the economy, it's important to apply them uniformly and, if you will, without basically picking out and saying, gee, you know, Google's a particularly neat company and they've asked us to trust them and, wow, shouldn't we just trust them? You have to apply the rules, I think, consistently and not sporadically and not say, gee, Microsoft was a special company and let's apply it to them but not to Google because they've got more lobbyists. You've got to apply it uniformly. And all that I'm saying is I think it's worthy to debate whether or not what Google has done violates the antitrust laws. But I think it's important as a first step for Google to recognize that it's subject to those laws, just like it was an important step for Microsoft to understand as a first step that it was subject to those laws. Let me, uh, I, I know people want to jump in here. Baron, you wanted to, to, to jump in on that point, and then I'm going to ask Jim a question. Well, it's a straw man. No, nobody's arguing that uh, the antitrust laws don't apply here or shouldn't apply to Google. I, I do think they apply. I think consumer welfare is the right standard. Uh, by which to gauge all of these things. A and, and that's the question, not consistency. Um, in other words, uh, if, if the government has made a mistake in the past, what we should be focused on today is not should we replicate exactly the enforcement action against Microsoft, but rather we should learn from that and ask, did, did the Microsoft intervention uh, actually serve consumers? And if so, how do we apply that right. lesson today? Can I just ask you one question, Darren? The question is, you're right, nobody's ever come out and said that, although I'm, I'm not sure, you know, maybe you are, but I don't think you are, that the law shouldn't apply to them. But the question is, they have gone far in terms of trying to say that they are not a monopoly, which is essentially, I mean, it's not that Microsoft ever said the law doesn't apply to us. They said we're not a monopoly. We're in a fast-moving industry. 
nobody can ever uh, regulate us because it's too complex technologically. All we're trying to do is integrate products. The question is, and, and Google, what Google doesn't seem to be willing to acknowledge, notwithstanding all of the, the evidence against it, that it's a monopoly. Would you agree or not that it has monopoly power under the law? Well, the, the, the first question here to ask is, uh, does Google have market power? You're, you're absolutely right. The second question, because that's not illegal, of course. Second question to ask is whether Google is abusing that power. Third question to ask is, is, is it harming consumers? And the fourth question to ask is, is there some remedy that we can craft that understanding error costs is actually likely to make consumers better off? And, and I am skeptical that in the end, about those things, we're going to come up with sweeping uh, remedies here that will solve this problem better than market forces. Okay, but, but, but what, what's the answer to the first question? The answer, well, again, th you have to break this down in particular areas. And I think that on the whole, what Google is really getting at, to be fair to them, is not to say that they don't have uh, not a monopoly, but to say that, that there are, that, that entry is relatively easy uh, and, and the barriers to, to access are relatively low. So, so, let's, so let's ask about that. And the question then becomes what I was getting at about defining the market. So, so Bing right now has, has par done a great uh, partnership with Yahoo, which I, I defended and argued should be approved as quickly as possible. And that, market se that, sh that program seems to be succeeding. Their market share is indeed growing, and it's now it's over 30%, which is uh, over half of what Google's market share in the U.S. is today. So they seem to be doing relatively well. But my, my point, again, in the broad picture is about, about uh, the potential for entry from new and unforeseen competitors. And this is not hypothetical. We are already seeing today that companies are changing the way that they present themselves to the world through search engine optimization to account for the fact that more and more people are no longer putting in keywords to find things, but using tools like Facebook. And Google Plus is best understood as Google's attempt to, to respond to the existential threat that Facebook offers. And thus far, it's, you know, it's a great product. It doesn't seem to be catching on in the way that Google had hoped that it would. Well, let me ask a, a piece of this question to, to both Jim and, and Tom, because it, it does seem uh, there is a sense of deja vu here. I mean, those of us who are following the uh, antitrust application to IBM uh, saw a series of arguments about what IBM's power was in the data processing computing world uh, at a time when it looked like mainframe computing was dominating and would, for the foreseeable future, dominate computing right before the uh, evolution of PCs and desktops and things that really changed the market power uh, for IBM. Uh, we saw the same application with Microsoft in the browser wars. We saw a lot of the argument made uh, in the same uh, context over the operating system, the question about what would happen there, whether there would be evolutions that would uh, constrain the power there. The antitrust authorities in much of the world thought that nothing would ever constrain Microsoft power right before cloud computing and other things developed. We saw this with AT&T when the case was brought against them right before the development of cellular telephony. Um, my, my question to, to uh, Jim and Tom is, it, are we in a world where we've seen so many iterations of technology changing rapidly enough that by the time we work through any trust, uh, we are past the point where it might have done good if it were the right thing to do? Uh, or are we at a point where we think we have a technology that is different or a time frame that is different? And secondly, uh, to both of you, the, the question that Rick and, and Barron were debating to some extent was the so what question. The uh, assume we have a problem here, assume we have something that is being done wrong, and we can talk uh, uh, later on the panel about what's being done wrong, if anything. The, the, the so what question, though, is do we have a remedy? that will work to make things better. And that was one of the things uh, that uh, was raised uh, during uh, your uh, comments, Jim, I know, when you were talking about uh, the fact that you have inevitably certain things that go along with the search function. So let me ask you and then Tom to, to take those two on. So let me take them up in that order. The first question is about the role of antitrust in an industry that has seen so many changes and so many kinds of disruptive innovation over the years. And I have to completely agree uh, with Rick here that antitrust always applies across the board. The question is merely, can we be specifically precise about the facts and apply the doctrines 
understanding the actual conditions in the industries we apply it to. The arguments about high tech are not arguments that antitrust should keep its hands off. They are arguments that an understanding what market power means or understanding which practices actually harm consumers, we have to be much more careful and attentive to the facts of the industry. And what I've seen actually is not so much arguments that antitrust is categorically out of place and we shouldn't use it, but actually attempts to end run the rather difficult barriers that antitrust presents to bringing the legal system in. I've seen the arguments around search neutrality have basically been attempts to circumvent antitrust's requirements of market power, of unlawful practices in one way or another, by framing arguments that on their surface seem to sound in defamation or in other kinds of business torts. And these are basically arguments made most frequently by competitors or made by websites that are unhappy that Google has been able to do what they do better. That rather than send consumers on a long wild goose chase where they see lots of ads on these websites, Google simply gives people the answer in one step rather than five and attempts to fit legal theories to bail them out without going through the difficult analysis that antitrust actually requires. So I think you should be concerned about the opposite problem here, which is short-circuiting antitrust, not necessarily bring it in, and a properly skeptical attitude about regulation and fast-moving markets requires not being fuzzy about antitrust, but being careful about its factual application. The second part of your question was about remedies <coughs> that works. My nightmare scenario when it comes to what government could do around Google if it missteps would be that some low value website, some site that presents a little bit of information with a lot of ads in a confusing way, manages to convince a court or an antitrust regulator that it deserves protection from the evil Google. And as a result, Google is required to provide service to the site, to provide it with cheap ads, to provide it with a high ranking in its position in algorithms, and not to change its algorithm in ways that would penalize this site in the rankings, to maintain it where it is, high on the first page of results. And when that happens, you basically shut down search innovation. You keep Google from experimenting with new ways of ranking and presenting results that might benefit consumers by getting them the information they want in fewer clicks, in less time, with fewer distracting websites. You drive consumers to inferior options among websites because you have mistakenly over-regulated there. Even if one of these websites is beneficial, even if in a particular case they've been helpful to consumers, that kind of intervention, which you see in a number of the arguments directed against Google, that kind of intervention basically all but guarantees that search will be a doomed technology overtaken by something else, not separate from those restraints. So I'm very concerned about interventions here that try to lock down how Google or others perform search and ranking, because those have the potential to destroy many of the enormous consumer benefits from search. Tom? One of my um, favorite quotes is from our former president, John Adams, who once said, facts are stubborn things. Facts are also important things. A lot, and I'm glad to hear uh, Jim actually mention facts. Um, in this debate, I hear a lot of platitudes, frankly, gross over generalizations um, that may sort of sound good, but don't really come to grips with the actual facts. Um, you know, should we be careful about uh, antitrust intervention in dynamic high-tech markets? Sure, absolutely. You need to take those facts into account. But does that mean that you should abdicate antitrust enforcement? Absolutely not. You need to roll up your sleeves and look, look at the facts. Let me start with the fact of does Google have market power, the question Rick asked. I think he asked it twice. With respect, I don't think you got an answer. It's a pretty simple fact. I would suggest to you it's <clears throat> um, 
The DOJ has concluded they have market power. The FTC has concluded they have market power. A judge up in New York has concluded they have market power. I don't think it's you can seriously dispute that they have market power in search and paid search. But those are the kind of facts that you need to look at. Second, you start raising the specter of, well, we're, 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 uh, we can never regulate the search algorithm, and we never, it's purely subjective opinion. You may note, if you go back to my opening remarks, that the example I gave you doesn't have anything to do with regulating their search algorithm. They're just, with respect, ignoring that fact. You have Google stealing somebody else's content, using it to build their own product on the back of that uh, investment made by that company, and moving into a space where it can credibly come to dominate it. Those are facts. That's a problem. There's a pretty direct remedy. You just prohibit Google from using somebody else's content without their consent. Very easy. So I, I lose, um, well, lose patience isn't the right word, but um, I don't think it advances the debate to talk in broad generalizations and broad platitudes. I will, uh, I will end, though, with a broader observation. Look. Um, I, too, believe in free markets. I think they're the most efficient way we have to organize our commerce. I am worried about arguments that lead to the implication de facto that the antitrust laws really don't have a role to play. Because what you will end up with, then, is a choice between allowing a company to exercise its power in an unfettered fashion and expand its dominance and a choice of other forms of government regulation. You think about what Jim said in the beginning. He basically, with respect to the algorithm, said it's impossible to deal with what's going on. Well, one way to do that is to set up a government uh, internet regulatory body that will either regulate the algorithm or require that all search engines be separated from any other content. I don't know that that's a particularly efficient way to run the economy either. And so I think it's worth bearing in mind that if we aren't going to have effective antitrust enforcement, we may end up with something that uh, many people would view as even worse. I'd like to respond to the discussion of Google stealing TripAdvisor content. I think that that's a misleading characterization of the relationship. At any point, Google has always offered to any website the opportunity to opt out of having any of its content used by Google in any way. And you referred to this as Google threatening them with complete exclusion. But that is Google offering any website that does not want to deal with it the opportunity never to have to deal with Google. So in that sense, Google is stealing nothing. All of this has been done with permission of TripAdvisor and with the other websites. So this is TripAdvisor may be upset. It is not like the terms on which Google offers to deal with it, but it's TripAdvisor's choice whether or not to accept that deal. And the point of this in antitrust terms is that this changes the nature of the question because it now becomes whether TripAdvisor and other sites like it are under some kind of compulsion that requires them to deal with Google in this way, either because it is an essential facility, a test that has its own very rigorous thresholds, or because it is exerting some other kind of market power on them that compels them to come to the table. And that requires further proof that we have not heard yet. Wait, the other what? piece of this is that TripAdvisor also has the option to reorganize its own content in a way that makes it clear that certain pieces of it, for example, its general pages, are open to Google, and other parts that it held reviews are not. Reorganization of its site, and use of protocols, the robots.txt files and the robot exclusion headers can enable it to say, this content, Google, you may index, please include. This content, the things we prefer not to share, you may not. I, I know that Tom had a, a, a slight intervention. I know that uh, there are a couple of other things we want to get back to. Um, with respect, I think you've forgotten an entire line of antitrust case law having to do with tying, which the last I heard can be unlawful under both the rule of reason and even the per se rule. If Google tells a company, you cannot deal with this at all, that's no different than the seller of a dominant widget 
saying that you can not buy my widget, but if you do, you also have to buy this other product over here. That's called tying. It's a pretty standard antitrust violation and a pretty straightforward application of it. Moreover, with respect, his suggested fix that, well, you don't have to block us from crawling all of your pages. You just block us from crawling the pages that have the user re reviews on it. Well, if you know anything about the way search works, if TripAdvisor wants those its links to appear on Google search results, it's not just the home page that triggers that. It's the page with the user review that's got words on it that deem it to be relevant. So Google is telling TripAdvisor the content, you know, your crown jewel user reviews that enable you to be, you know, appear high under the search algorithm because users like it, just block that portion and you'll be okay. Not exactly comforting. Let me uh, ask Baron and Rick to, to jump in on the on the tying issue here because, you know, when, when both of you were talking earlier about the Microsoft case and whether it was right or wrong and whether it uh, advanced uh, consumer interests or not, uh, a large piece of what was argued, uh, as, as you know, in the Microsoft case was the tying question. And you had uh, essentially two very different views of what tying law should be going into the case. And I think it's fair to say the D.C. Circuit said uh, we're going to take a, a slightly different course than either of you may be arguing for. Do, do you think they got it right in the Microsoft case, and how do you think it applies here? Well, I mean, I'll, I'll start. I, I, don't, I don't mean to correct you, but I'll just give you a slightly different take on what the court uh, said for those of you who are interested. But, you know, there was a lot of, liti a lot of litigation before Judge Jackson uh, was under the so-called per se standard of tie-in for uh, a Section 1 violation. What the court, when it went up to the court, the court said, look, where you're talking about platform uh, software and integration into platform software, we don't have enough experience to treat it under the per se rule. Government, if you want to go back down and prove that it's illegal under the rule of reason under Section 1, you can do so. The government declined uh, when the case was remanded. However, and this is important, I think, the thing that the Court of Appeals said, and this is also with respect to some of the exclusive dealing uh, claims, but also the tying claims, the standard's somewhat different when you're talking about Section 2. And if a company like Microsoft is found to have monopoly power, or if it happens to be Google, and I do think that the evidence is pretty overwhelming that they have monopoly power, then what you can do with that is much different. Um, and whether you characterize what they've done with TripAdvisor as a tie-in, or you've characterized it as a conditional refusal to deal by a monopolist, Either way, there's plenty of precedent to say that if you have a monopoly and um, if you use it in certain ways to um, harm competition, uh, to exclude people from the marketplace, to extract things from folks you couldn't otherwise get, then you may violate the law under Section 2. That's why, you know, the, the whole question of whether they have monopoly power and the special circumstances that they're subject to are important. Last point I want to just say is, you know, I certainly agree with Tom, and I think most lawyers would say, you know, the facts are important, and that is what's very important. The interesting thing about what Google has done, I think the FTC, the EU, will ultimately get to the bottom of it, and I should, in the interest of uh, full disclosure, I'll say I represent a couple of the plaintiffs uh, who are suing Google who feel that they have been excluded uh, improperly, uh, both in terms of search advertising but also search. And to some extent, when Professor Gremmelman talks about those sites, he refers to what they look like today. Well, trust me, what they look like today after having been starved of traffic uh, for several years is very different from what they looked like when Google was talking about them as being, you know, number one sites and that sort of thing until Google made a decision to deny them of traffic. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that it's important to look at the facts, but what Google's been very successful in doing is avoiding exposing anything to the facts, to, to the light of day. They've used a lot of platitudes to defend what they've done. They've made a lot of arguments like, well, we're 
we're just trying to get rid of the junk sites, um, that various times they've said their search process is completely neutral and objective. There's no manual overrides. More recently, they've started to say that there are manual overrides. Well, look, I don't know, but let's look at the facts. And, and you know, hopefully at some point, I think the FTC will get past their uh, procedural objections. But everybody just needs to understand that in no case yet today, in an antitrust case, has Google had to give discovery. So they've managed to obscure the facts. Certainly they're right. Certainly they're, uh, it's appropriate to defend it. But no court has yet had an opportunity to look at the facts. And that's an important thing for everybody to understand. So, so this really comes back to the, what, uh, the, the dialogue that uh, Rick and I were having about market power. And, and you always, my point was, you have to look at the very specific cases you're talking about. So in this particular case, a lot of this argument seems to come down to assertions that 30% or so of the traffic that these travel sites get comes from Google. But my understanding is if you actually look at that traffic and if you break it down and, for example, remove the Google searches for things like Expedia, right, so you know, getting to Expedia just as a navigation tool, that way it actually seems to be the case that about 8% on average of these, traffics, uh, um, these, these travel sites traffic comes from Google. So, so that, that is really, in terms of looking at the facts, that I think is a very important thing to understand when we're talking about market power. If we, if, if we lived in a world where we were talking about a much higher number, much higher percentage of traffic coming to these sites from Google, I think the facts would be very different, and we would have a different analysis of market power. The point here is it seems to be the case that these sites get by just fine, as does Yelp, which I use on my phone and I use on the app on here, but they get by just fine getting traffic from other sources. And more generally, let me step back and say Tom's exactly right. We have to be very careful here about high-level slogans. We also have to be very careful about thinking that, um, that facts are simple things. Uh, I, I think in particular here, uh, I view a lot of the debate about antitrust law and uh, competition today through the lens of, of Tim Wu's book, The Master Switch. So I had the great fortune to have Tom for antitrust and Tim Wu for, for internet law. And Tim, as you, as, as you all probably know, makes a broad argument for sweeping intervention. But there's a single sentence in the book that to me sort of undermines his whole premise, which is where he says, very much in, in the same vein as what um, Tom is getting at, the government can act only on the basis of what it understands to be established fact. Much of what is called lobbying must actually be recognized as, as a campaign to establish as conventional wisdom the right facts, whether pertaining to climate change, the advantages of charter schools, or the ideal t uh, technology for broadcasting. And the point here is simply to say that we can look at individual facts, but facts without context mean nothing. And the context here is precisely what is unclear. And so when we look, for example, at, again, the market and how people find information, I submit that we really fundamentally don't fully understand yet how people are finding information, how they will find information tomorrow. What we do know is it seems to be shifting. And the reason we know that, that I think the most important facts for us to look at in this sea of potentially conflicting or bewildering facts that do not on their own speak for themselves, look at search engine optimization and, and consider that to be a mirror of the industry. And what I was suggesting earlier is that if you looked at the facts in that case several years ago, you would have thought that Google's algorithm was going to be forever dominant because it seemed to be the case that everyone out there was optimizing the way that they structured their content to respond to Google. That was a very powerful indicator of market power. And it seems to be the case today that that is shifting. It's shifting towards people finding information through social media, through tools that Google actually is pretty far behind in, and that Microsoft's partner, Facebook, seems to be leading in. So again, I, just, I want to submit here that we have to be careful in looking at any one of these things and understand that what might be seen as market power in, in one dimension may not be market power. It may be particularly vulnerable to new entry, which is what m Google in general is talking about when they submit that their market share doesn't really reveal the, the, the weakness of their market power. Well, I think well, the one thing, can I just, I mean, and it would be nice for you guys to address this. Look, where they make their money is selling advertising. And to some extent, that's related to data. Um, and it seems to me pretty hard to argue that they don't have market power in terms of search advertising. And again, that's something that all agencies have looked at, have essentially come to the conclusion that that is a market. They have what is, has, you know, regularly been deemed a monopoly share. And to the extent that the facts would actually show that what they're trying to do is deny uh, or exclude from the market potential threats to that monopoly for search advertising dollars or a threat to basically take away the data 
uh, because people like some of these search sites and essentially spend all their time on those search sites and that data gets captured by those search sites and not by Google. If that's the motivation, do you think it's perfectly okay if that's what the facts would show? So, so we're, we're going to get one quick answer and then we're going to go to our social medium, which is the audience. So now we're finally getting into a problem and the question of a narrowly tailored remedy. And I would submit here that what you really need to look at, if this is indeed the supposed problem, is look at the advertising marketplace and ask whether whether Google has unfairly, in some sense, boxed advertisers into its platform. And this, this we get into a debate about, about AdWords and data portability. But my thesis, in general, is that antitrust, as I mentioned earlier, serves the consumer best when, for example, it gives companies an incentive to lower switching costs, to make data portable. So as an advertiser today, I can export my data and I can import it into Microsoft's uh, ad center. Now, if we want to get into a debate about whether the terms of service that Google attaches to that API that uh, prohibit third parties from building tools that would synchronize campaigns across multiple websites, that's the right sandbox to be in. Because then at least we're talking about uh, a, a clearly specified alleged harm and a remedy that facilitates competition and could potentially help consumers. But there we're may gonna, be other we're, mechanisms we're gonna, we're gonna see if, if we have uh, questions from the other people in our sandbox here before we uh, get ba back to other things. Those of you who have questions, raise your hand, we'll get a microphone uh, to you. Mr. Rule, you made a point earlier that... And you, you should say who you are ah. at, at the outset. I'm Alexander R. Cohen of the Business Rights Center of the Atlas Society. Mr. Rule, you said, at the out, you said earlier that the law must be enforced equally. But you also said that under the antitrust law, there are things that other companies can do that Google may not do. Isn't, it, isn't that itself an inequality being enforced by law? And does that undermine your argument that the law must be enforced equally to Google? No. Um, in a word, I mean the the reason that the law section two, I mean section two is what section two is. It requires monopoly power because that's what the law says. But uh, economically, it is also the case that if you have monopoly power, the power to raise price or exclude competition, or indirect, in, indirectly shown by a large market share, you have the ability you may have the incentive uh, to use that power in a way that harms consumer welfare by excluding competitors, by doing other things that are inefficient. On the other hand, if you have a very small market share, um, the fact that you try to exclude competitors, the fact that you try to raise price is essentially futile. And companies do make mistakes. Uh, but there's, I think, a, a wise choice that we're not going to expend society's resources going after those small companies. So that's the reason that uh, Justice Scalia is typically the, uh, the, the source for the comment that I made, that he said in the uh, Eastman Kodak case uh, that, in effect, uh, there are things that large companies, that companies with monopoly power cannot do that other companies can routinely. And uh, again, that's why a, an important precursor is whether or not Google has monopoly power, which I believe they clearly do. And once you get to that point, the law is fairly well developed in understanding that there are things, there are things they can or can't do. I will grant you it's a question of fact. There's a recognition that there may be justifications for their conduct. But that's, in which, that's the way in which the, the law makes that distinction. And it's a wise distinction. Yes, cross here. Just hang on one second. We'll get the microphone to you. And you can tell us who you are and what the question is. Uh, yes, Justin Serafini. A quick question about the intersection between intellectual property law and antitrust law in the Google context. I know you mentioned uh, that in the context of Google Books. But it's also been interesting because Google has gone on the offensive, at least in the IP arena, uh, making antitrust allegations against Apple and some of its other competitors uh, in the wireless space. I'm just curious, again, what your thoughts are, both in search and the rest of Google's business, of how uh, IP may play into antitrust issues for them. Was, well, that, was that for anyone in particular or just whoever it takes? I, I would just reiterate, if, uh, you know, this is what Trinco was all about. There is no duty to deal. So e even a company that has market power does not, until you get to the extreme edge case of, of you know, alleging that somebody is an essential facility, there is no duty to deal. Your intellectual property is your own, and it's yours to do with as you want. The, the thing that I, you know, just 
very briefly, of course, again, I think everybody own, understands this, but it has been up to this point Google that has been pressing the Department of Justice to investigate others' acquisitions of intellectual property. Um, I mean, you could explain it. I think Google likes people to adopt Android for free, and even though there's a lot of evidence that uh, Android infringes various patents, including those uh, owned by Oracle, those owned by uh, Apple, those owned by Microsoft. Uh, Google essentially complains about people trying to uh, be recompensed for the technology that's incorporated in those. I think that the interesting thing will be when Google acquires Motorola, whether or not they will use that technology and essentially license it generally, or they'll license it strategically to uh, encourage OEMs to adopt uh, Android, uh, but discriminatorily against OEMs that use other platforms uh, on smartphones and tablets. Well, one, one question here, and I, I want to get uh, Jim and, and Baron on this as well, is really whether what we're seeing is antitrust uh, starting to merge into intellectual property law now. As someone who teaches uh, in the intellectual property as well as the antitrust area, uh, we see the rock star uh, patent auction. We see the uh, combination of firms trying to, to bid to keep patents uh, away from some people and to use them uh, for their own purposes for others, not just licensing, but also uh, strategically, both offensively and defensively. Is is this really where uh, antitrust is going to be headed? And if so, do we have different rules that we ought to be thinking about in that context? And I, I know, Jim, you and, and Baron, you had your hands up. So I just wanted to make two quick points about the sudden outbreak of patent accusations around smartphones and Android. The first is that what we're seeing there is partly our broken patent system coming home to roost in which every smartphone out there reads on so many patents owned by so many people, so many of which would not be found valid if subjected to any vigorous examination, that we're simply seeing a general tax on innovation in that industry coming from the patent system. And the second is a point about Google's acquisition of Motorola which seems to have been driven primarily by the desire to obtain a big patent pool, which is I would say that if regulators are thinking about antitrust scrutiny there, it's not the role of the antitrust system to save companies from their own catastrophic mistakes. Well, I, I, I would suggest that all, uh, this entire audience should be very used to the idea that uh, government intervention begets intervention. And the story that, uh, that we generally tell about the world is the many ways in which government screws up the marketplace and companies have to try to route around that. So I see this, um, this situation with Motorola and, and uh, Google's desire to acquire a patent pool as very similar to the situation that AT&T uh, is in buying T-Mobile. And in both cases, I see those companies trying to route around government's terrible mismanagement of the, the vital asset that is uh, key in both of those industries. Here, patents, and in, in uh, AT&T's case, um, both uh, spectrum and tower sightings. And in both cases, I'm, again, skeptical about antitrust uh, intervention. I support, if you want to put it that way, Google and AT&T, two companies that hate each other and are seldom found in bed together. And, and I think that uh, James is exactly right. The answer is to fix the underlying problems, improve the, the, the patent system, prevent uh, it, it from being so easy to, for example, prevent this particular tablet from being distributed at all in Europe. Right? and return to a clear uh, grounding in consumer welfare. And on that grounding, I would indeed be uh, troubled if Google were to buy Motorola and start discriminating against others in the Android marketplace, uh, other companies, uh, in terms of access to Motorola. Now, Google has said pretty unequivocally they're not going to do that. If that's your specific concern, once again, let's look for a narrow remedy and let's encode that. But they, they, they've already said that. So you can raise the concern, and that's a fair concern to raise. But I, I think it would be a little misleading to suggest to the audience that, that Google has any, made any intention of doing just, that. Just so, just so it's clear, what I said was using its patents in a discriminatory fashion against OEMs that use non-Android platforms. That's a different point from what Google has said, that it won't favor Motorola with respect to uh, Android innovations vis-a-vis uh, -vis other OEMs. And the, the question, I think, that folks you know, legitimately can look at with respect to patent acquisitions is whether or not somebody acquires patents that may be essential patents under certain standards that are necessary in order to uh, 
produce, for example, a smartphone, and whether or not they, you, they provide access on discriminatory terms and say, you can have it for free as long as you uh, are running Android, but either you can't have it at all or you can only have it at prohibitory, at prohibitory rates if you're running a non-Android platform. That could be a problem. And frankly, if you look at the way Google has provided access to uh, Android, provided uh, compatibility, uh, used its compatibility standards to try to get, you know, block anybody from using any other mobile search on their platforms, there's reason to believe that Google might, in fact, be tempted to use its patents in that kind of discriminatory fashion. I think we have time for one more question. Right back behind you there. Hello, I'm Corey Carpenter. Um, I actually had a question for Professor Grimmelman, because you mentioned in your opening that speech is, or search is inherently political in nature, and that Google, through its algorithm, exercises editorial control. Would a First Amendment claim in speech, you know, search neutrality in this situation, would that change the antitrust um, equation for determining whether Google's doing anything wrong by limiting access to their forum that they've created? So this kind of question, a First Amendment defense for Google's practices, has been before the court several times. And they have tended to recognize that Google has a First Amendment interest in its search results. I think that that has to be right, that there is some aspect of search that is clearly a form of speech, but I think that it also can't be conclusive, that this cannot be an absolute shield for all of their business practices just because it's carried on over the internet. And where the line between is to be drawn, I'm not quite certain of, but it has to be somewhere between those two extremes. Well, I want to thank our panel members. I, I know that uh, there's been a, a lot of discussion about uh, the right level of skepticism to have about government. I, I know these are all truly skeptical people because when I was talking with them about the money offer me from Nigeria, uh, if I would just help them out, they, they, they all told me uh, not, not to go there. Um, we we uh, are fortunate to have them. We appreciate it. And I uh, look forward to seeing you all at the next Federal Society event. Thank you. <laughs>